Hey, uh, today we are uh, not in a series. As a matter of fact, this message was not planned. Uh, I wrote another message, but um, as we went into the weekend, the Holy Spirit just stirred my heart to preach this today. And all I can figure is that many of you need what the title says, you need staying power, staying power. Um, a few years ago, Kayla and I renovated our, our bathroom and, um, you know, we were so excited. We picked out all the finishes we want. We, um, you know, we met, made sure all the expansions were right. I mean, you're excited to get the finished product. And I remember the last meeting with the contractor asking this question, about how long will it take you to do this? And the contractor said, ah, oh, about a week. And I went into that thinking he was telling me the truth. At day three, I was concerned he would meet his deadline. By day five, I was certain he wouldn't meet his deadline. By day 10, I wondered if I'd ever have my house back. By day 17, I thought, you know, I'll just sell the house. We'll go find another one. And by day 25, I was ready to commit assault on this contractor. <laughs> Here's what that taught me. It takes faith to start. It takes more faith to finish. Ex beginnings are exciting and ends are fun, but the middle can be quite messy. And that's just true of so many places in our lives. Some of you are experiencing that right now because, listen, when you started this program, you were so excited, but now the semesters are grinding you down and graduation is still far ahead. For some of you, the newborn season, oh, there was nothing better. But now they're a teenager and you want a DNA test. You know, for some of you, when he was your fiance, oh, you thought you'd found the one. But now you wonder where his mother has went wrong as you have gotten to see all of his problems. For some of you, you just took a position you always said you wanted, but now you see what it's like to referee the people that you're now over. You know, and it's in these messy middles that, that really what we most rationalize to do is we should just bail out. As a matter of fact, that is culture's answer to tough seasons. Just change. Just quit. I mean, you don't like your teacher? Find a new one. You, you, you don't like um, your church? Just get a new one. You don't like your boss? Get a new one. You don't like your husband? Get a new one. That seems to be culture's answer for everything is just leave and find something new. The problem with that, though, is that culture doesn't tell you that some of God's greatest blessings come when you simply stay put. You know this is true in other parts of your life. I mean, think about it. If you'd have stuck with that fitness routine, you'd be beach ready today. If, if, you would have, if you would have stuck with that life group, you'd have the friendships you really wanted. If you would have stuck with those stocks, I had someone tell me recently that their dad bought a small upstart and didn't believe it would really go anywhere, and so he sold his stocks. That small upstart was called Apple. Can you imagine had he stayed? You know, and that what's true of us in these areas of life is true exponentially in Scripture. As a matter of fact, you may not know this, the greatest promise in Scripture came because people stayed. Um, in the book of Acts is the account, in the beginning especially, of the, the church and how it launched out in, from Jerusalem to the rest of the world. And when you read the book of Acts, here's what you're going to see. A lot of supernatural power, a lot of miracles, resurrections, healings. I mean, it's, it's a power-packed book. What you may miss, though, is that all of that supernatural power was only possible because some people had some staying power. As a matter of fact, um, Acts chapter 1, it, the context of it is that Jesus has died and rose again. And that from his resurrection, there was a period of time of about 40 days before his ascension into heaven. Well, in this 40 days, he regathers all of his disciples who were um, kind of split apart due to fear. And he pulls them back together, and he kind of has a meeting where he tells them, here's what's coming, and here's what I need you to do. Well, you can imagine Peter's real excited. He's like, oh, I've already prepared a mission statement for the church, and Matthew's an accountant, so he's already put together like an Excel sheet so they can track contributions. They're basically saying, we're ready to go. Where do you want us to go? And Jesus' instructions kind of confound them because he says, I don't want you to go anywhere. I want you to stay. I want you to stay until the Holy Spirit comes and fills your life so that you have power. And I know that was challenging for them because they were so ready to make it happen in their strength, but his instruction was to stay. As a matter of fact, he didn't just tell them to stay, just the 12 disciples. He told all of his followers to stay in Jerusalem 
until the Holy Spirit came. Um, it's referenced in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. Look at this. It says, and after that, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. So Jesus didn't just tell 12 people to stay. He told 500 people, stay. Stay and wait. Stay in worship. Stay in prayer until the Holy Spirit comes. Well, that's what they did. They stayed in Jerusalem in houses and, and squares. They stayed and they prayed and they waited. But as the time passed and the pressure kind of increased, all of a sudden, some of those 500 started to dissipate. And Scripture says that when the Holy Spirit finally came, there were not 500. As a matter of fact, you can see it in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. What? 120? We started with 500. What happened to the other 380? They didn't have the staying power. They, missed, they were invited to be a part of the greatest move of God humanity's ever known. And they missed the power of God because they didn't have the staying power that they needed to see it come to pass. You see, sometimes it's not about just making it happen. Sometimes you can't control the circumstances. Sometimes your only option is to stay or quit. And I just sense that the Holy Spirit sent me here this weekend for many of you who are ready to give up, who are feeling like the disciples felt. You're frustrated that this addiction is continuing to ruin your life. You're frustrated that the, the marriage hasn't gotten any better. You're, you're upset that despite your hard work, you're still stuck in this place you don't want to be in. And you're ready to throw up your hands, walk out, and quit on this season. And I just sense the Holy Spirit saying the same thing that he said to them 2,000 years ago. He's saying to you, trust me and stay. I know it's tough, but stay in worship. I know it's difficult, but stay in prayer. I, I know it's not fun, but stay investing God's word into your mind. Stay serving with a spirit of excellence. Stay investing in this marriage. Stay, 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 because you're giving God an opportunity to do a miracle in your life. What God's teaching you in this season is not everything comes from your striving. Some things come from you staying, just you standing there until he does his work. Some of you believe you've got to make everything happen, and the Holy Spirit's saying, sometimes I'm going to bring you to a season where you can't make anything happen, and you have to stand in staying and just trust that my word will be performed. But listen, you're not waiting on circumstances. You're not waiting on situations. You're waiting on your heavenly father. And he is not someone who's aloof and he's not off on something else. He has perfect timing for everything he does. And you're not waiting on circumstance. You're waiting on him. And he rewards those who are faithful and he always perfects his word. And sometimes faith is not displayed in a burst of energy. Sometimes faith looks like a stubbornness to stay. And so what I want to do today is, is I, I want to give you three situations you may be in, and it's three situations that you need to stay in because God's at work. Here's the first one. Stay when you feel overlooked. There's nothing worse than not being picked for the team, you know, not being passed over for the, the promotion, being stood up on the date. In these moments that we're overlooked, we just feel so broken that we just want to get out of it as quick as possible. And that's where some of you are this week. You're ready to bail because you feel underappreciated, that people don't see your value, that, that they don't see what's on the inside of you. Well, let, let me just encourage you that despite the fact that people don't see what's in you, God does. He has his eyes on you. And that's just a common reality in Scripture. You know, everybody saw Moses as a simple shepherd, but God saw him as a national deliverer. Everybody saw David as just an errand boy, but God saw a king. That everybody just saw Peter as a, a rough fisherman. God saw a church planter. The reality is just because people see you as ordinary doesn't mean God doesn't have something extraordinary planned. That we have to realize that just because they don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. But we have to also understand that there's a tension in this life of following Christ. And it's this. There's always more on the inside of you than you see around you. That's how God draws you into new seasons. 
Listen, I, I know right now you're thinking, I want to own my own home, but I'm stuck rent, uh, renting and, and there's got these noisy neighbors. That tension, yes, you're going to own that home one day, but in this season, God's doing something. I, I know for some of you, you, you think, I've got a ministry that I want to do, but nobody seems to notice. Well, you know what? Maybe God's got you staying in this season, doing something that's not in your giftings just because he's doing something in you. Some of you feel like, I've got so much more to give and no one sees it, but God sees it and he's got you in a season and where you're staying under. Maybe someone who, who isn't as talented as you or not as good a leader as you are, but he's having you stay because he's drawing something out. See, the, the reality is God isn't just always working to where we're going to arrive. Somewhere he's working on the character that's going to be a part of when we arrive. He wants to see ultimately if we're faithful. Luke 16.10 says it this way, whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever's dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. Here's the problem. We think only the big things matter. But to God, small things matter. As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Exodus, which is a big book, it actually accounts God bringing three million people out of slavery and into a nation. It's a big book. Did you know there are nine chapters in Exodus that are dedicated to where they should put the furniture in the tabernacle, what colors the curtains and threads should be, and what the ingredients are for the anointing oil. You see, to God, little things are big things. And, and the devil's not in the details, God is. He watches the smallest things of our lives because they matter to him because they tell us how we'll handle the biggest things that we want. Let, let me say it this way. How you treat people matters to God even if those people aren't big people. When you hold your tongue, God sees it. When you apologize, God sees it. When you serve someone who, who no one sees and you didn't post it on Instagram, God still sees it. When you do the small things well, it's showing God you're faithful and that he can trust you with bigger things in the future. And, and, and the truth is, what's in front of you right now, wherever you are, that small thing, that's not an obstacle to where you're going. That's preparing you for where you're going. I remember when I was uh, 19 years old, I'd launched into to, to ministry, desiring to be in ministry. But the problem was I didn't really have a lot of talents that were sought after. I, I, I couldn't sing, and at that point, I, I, I couldn't preach. I didn't like children or teenagers, so I wasn't really useful in those areas. And so the truth is I didn't have, I had zero opportunities. I had a desire to be in ministry, but zero opportunities. And some of my friends um, that were in my same kind of class, they had all kinds of opportunities, opportunities to preach, opportunities to go on staff at other churches. I had none. One day I got a call from uh, kind of our regional office of the network we were in, and they said, Joe, we'd like you to help us with a big event we've got coming up. I knew the event. It was a big worship service where everyone came together and worshiped, and, and only the biggest speakers and the, the, the brightest names would be there. And I thought, finally, they've called me. They know what I've got. And they said, what we need you to help us with is we're bringing in a big speaker. We need you to pick him up at the airport. Get his bags out of the luggage, uh, uh, luggage area. We need you to take him to the hotel, check into his room. We want you to make sure the batteries are right in the microphone. We want you to get him water if he needs anything. We just need you to be his assistant the whole time they're here. I was sitting there listening. I was thinking, gosh, I want to open the Bible for these people. And instead, you just called me to carry bags. Well, I don't know if you've ever had this happen. In that moment, is like the old cartoons. I had a devil and an angel sitting on each shoulder. And the devil said, you don't, they don't see what you've got. They don't understand. Just let somebody else carry the bags. That, that's below you. But the, the voice of that angel, the Holy Spirit said, Joe, you need to serve in the small things. So you know what I did? I went and cleaned that car. You could eat off the dashboard. I made sure that I was at the airport uh, 30 minutes before his plane ever arrived. I carried his bags. I loaded them up. I even drove the speed limit everywhere I took him. <laughs> I made sure that his hotel room was good. I made sure to change the batteries. I got him a room temperature or cold water. Which would you like? I did everything small because I just felt like this is pleasing God. Now, what's interesting about that is I was 19 years old, and the name of the speaker that I took care, took care of, his name was Billy Wilson. Billy then was just a, a very popular conference speaker. Today, he's the president of Oral Roberts University which I was asked two years ago to sit on with their board of trustees. So I now sit on the board beside the very man I served. And I remember the first board meeting when I walked in, the Holy Spirit just spoke very still in my heart, and he said, had you not carried his bags, you wouldn't have a seat on this board. But because I could trust you, I could place you here. Listen to me. You're not overlooked. 
you're under consideration. God's seeing how you handle this small season, and he's determining if he can trust you with a big season. So despite the fact you feel overlooked, stay and serve in this small place. Here's the second one. You need to stay when you don't understand. Isaiah 28, 16 says this, whoever believes will not act hastily. What that means is recklessly. They don't just go in and throw up their hands because their emotions overcame them. They don't just say, I quit. They're not going to do that because they believe. Now, now notice it says because they believe, not because they understand. See, there's this thing that I think is happening in the Christian community to where we have, are identifying more as understanders than believers. That we're only willing to walk in faith that we can see how it's going to come to pass. That we're only willing to venture into things that we know how they can work out. But if you're going to follow God, you're going to go into a lot of situations where you don't understand any of what he's trying to do. And you're still supposed to stay in that season. You see, for many of us, we spend more time trying to figure it out than express faith. And Jesus spoke to us about how to express faith in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. He said, so I tell you, when you pray for something, believe that you have already received it, then it will be yours. Now, if you're an English teacher, this sentence will mess you up. Because it's got all kinds of tenses that don't seem to make sense. Let, let's look at it. When he says, believe that you have received it, that means that's a past tense. But then he says, notice this, then he says, then it will be yours. That's a future tense. You know what he's saying? You have to believe like you've already got it in order to ever get it. Now, I know some of you didn't catch that. It's too early. Listen, <laughs> you have to believe it so and act like it's so for it ever to be so. And I know that's confusing, but here's the best news I've got for you today. You already know how to do this because you've ordered a pizza. <laughs> you called and ordered a pizza. And what happened is that order set off a chain reaction, a process. But you never got any of the updates or understood what that process is. I mean, you called and ordered it, but you know what didn't happen? You didn't get a call when they were putting sauce on it. That you didn't get a push notification when they added pepperoni. You have no idea what's happening and nothing has arrived, but you know what you do? You start setting out plates. You get napkins. You tell people, hey, we're going to be eating in 45 minutes or less. Get in here. <laughs> so you start acting like you've already got a thing that you have no idea how it's coming and, you, and it has not arrived yet, but you have so much faith in this delivery man that you're willing to act on it. You know what an unfortunate thing is? It's unfortunate we have more faith in dominoes than God. Because what happens is we pray and ask God for something, and the minute it takes a turn, we don't think it should take towards something. We go, oh, I guess he's not into this, and we quit and go off to something else. Listen, when you stay in faith and you start acting like something has happened when it hadn't even acted, it happened yet, you know what you're saying to God is, I trust you. I trust that your word is sure. I trust that my life can be founded on it. I trust that despite my lack of understanding, I know you perform your word to come to pass. And it's that kind of faith that we have to stay in when we don't understand. I remember I was sitting with a veteran pastor one time, and he, he was telling me old kind of old war stories. And his church had started in a very small storefront. They had no money. He was working another job, and they just had a few people. And they were in Texas, and the storefront they were in had no air conditioning. So the summer was coming, and he was concerned if he'd even be able to continue to have church. One day, he's sitting in a local restaurant, and there's some community men that are there, and they start asking him about his church. Pastor, we've heard your church is doing well. Um, what, is there any need you have? And he said, well, we need an air conditioning unit. And they talked a little bit more about the type they needed. And sure enough, one of the guys that didn't even attend the church but was sitting in that restaurant said, well, I've got a unit like that that we're not using at our shop. He said, I'll donate it to the church. He said, but here's the thing, Pastor. He said, I'll give you the unit, and I'll send my technician to put it in. He said, but you're going to have to come up with 25 feet of copper pipe in order to run it. He said, we'll put it in on Saturday. Well, the pastor didn't leave excited. He left frustrated because they had no money. And he had no way to get 25 foot of copper pipe. So there was this, in him, there's this internal struggle of, God, why would you do something halfway? I don't understand why you'd give us a unit but not give us what we need to actually have it work. 
And he said, I went through the whole week, couldn't figure out a way to get that copper pipe, had no money whatsoever, even looked at paying that for it out of our own expenses, but we, we didn't have the money. He said, on Friday night, I told my wife, I'm going to call that technician and said, they can just keep the unit. We can't find the pipe. And she said, no, I think you still need to show up. So he said, the next morning, I got up way early. I put on my work clothes, and I started driving to an air conditioning installation that couldn't be installed. He said, and as I'm going through, he said, the Texas towns, he said, there was a, a heavy fog. And he said, I pulled up to a stop sign. And while I'm sitting there, I happened to glance out of my right eye. I looked, and I could see in a ditch, it looked like there was some copper pipe. He said, I I didn't have anybody behind me. I put it in park. I got out, walked around, and sure enough, there was a big bundle of copper pipe. He said, I looked around to see if if I saw the truck it fell off of, if the person who owned it, it wasn't on private property. And he said, I took it as God had put it there. So he said, I picked it up and and, and put it onto the the trailer and, and showed up and gave it to the guy, not even knowing if it was enough. He said, at the end of the day, the technician came to him with a four-inch piece of copper pipe and said, Pastor, you sure know how to measure things exactly right. He said, this is all that was left from that that 25-foot you bought. Pastor said, that that four inches of copper pipe sits on my desk today. That church grew to thousands of people and impacted the world in an amazing way. He said, that's a reminder that sometimes you have to act like it's so, even though it's not so, until you see it come to pass. You may not understand how God's going to bring it about, but you just keep showing up. Because God performs his word. Now, here's the last one. You need to stay when you're worn out. And this is the hardest one. Because our emotions get involved and, you know, we start to struggle not only just with our faith, but with our physical and, and, and emotional life. Can you imagine? I mean, sometimes we read the scriptures and it's so, like, we just read it like it's a the Disney story. Like, these people didn't really struggle. I mean, can you imagine hearing from Jesus that, that he's going to die, seeing him die, but then seeing him raise again. I mean, the emotional roller coaster of that alone is enough, but then he says, well, I've raised again, but now I'm leaving. I mean, it's a constant, yes, no, yes, no. And then he says, oh, by the way, I want you to stay. I don't want you to do anything. I want you to just wait on the promise to come. And, 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 and that would have been hard enough because you're wondering, well, what day? Well, he didn't tell us. At what time? He never said. So you're sitting there and you're waiting and you're doing your best to stay focused in, in faith and you're, you're, you're praying and you're worshiping, but at the corner of your eye, you know what you see? That family that doesn't believe any longer, get up and leave. That friend of yours that you thought would always be on, they just get up, they leave. Slowly, slowly, 380 people start to disappear from this watch service. I can't imagine the internal dialogue that that 120 felt. We're, we're now the minority We've missed God some way. Did he really say that? It's the same thing many of you feel right now. As you lay there in your bed at night, you start to rationalize what God said. Maybe he didn't mean it that way, and maybe I didn't hear him, and maybe that was just the pizza I ordered, you know? You see how far your kids are moving away from Christ, and you think, maybe that verse, that promise about my family is not actually true. You get a doctor's report, and it's, it's, the, it's the, not the first one, it's the, the one that confirms what the first one said. You think, I, I don't get this. You see the accounts, and just starts to slowly, slowly, it's like your faith drained out. You know what I wish I could come in here today and do? Give you at least a calendar date. Like, I, I wish I could have come in and said, hey, God told me it's going to be April 13th. So just hold on till April 13th. Because at least then, I mean, that, that's several months away, but at least then you'd be able to say, okay, it's April 13th. It's not how God works. Instead, he gave me two encouragements for people who are worn out. Here's the first one. You have more in you than you realize. Um, you know, when we read the word of God, what we often miss is that God makes promises overtly and covertly. Okay, so let's, let me explain. Some promises of God are just clear. They're so overt. Like when he says, I shall supply all your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's just clear. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And that's encouraging. But sometimes his promises are covert. And what I, I mean by that is they don't look like promises. They actually look like commands. Like when he tells us to do something, that doesn't seem like it's a promise. That seems like something to do. But here's what you have to know. God will never ask you to do something he's not giving you the capacity to do. So every command is really a revelation of your capacity. Because it would be cruel of God to say, hey, you got to do this, and you don't have the capacity to do it. 
So when God says do something, he's saying, I've given you the ability to do it. So let me read you a, a, a covert promise. Matthew 7, 7. Keep on asking, and you will be given what you ask for. Keep on looking, and you'll find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open. See, some of us used to read this verse as, that, I've got to keep, I've got to keep, I've got to keep. But now that we know that God doesn't ask us to do something that he's not given us the capacity to do, you know what this says? I can keep, I can keep, I can keep. Not because there's something great in me, but because the Holy Spirit is going to give me a, a, a working of him in me. That he's given me the capacity, that he's given me the fortitude. That, and, and I know that, that that runs against what you feel because the enemy wants you to believe you're a quitter, that you're never going to see it come to pass, that you're going to fail at this and that you might as well give it up. But the Holy Spirit through this verse is saying, you can keep asking because I'm working in your life. You can keep praying because I'm here supporting you in your spiritual life. You can keep seeking because I'm going to be your eyes. Whatever you lack, I'm going to supply it by my riches in Christ Jesus. And so you you can keep on. That means that your spiritual DNA is not of a quitter, that you are, you have a fortitude you haven't even tapped into yet. There's a perseverance in you that you don't even realize is in there, that there is a foundational, immovable stubbornness of the spirit of God that is in you. And when you have come to your end, you've just come to the beginning of him. And he is going to keep you in your keeping until this comes to pass. There's more in you than you realize. But also, I, I want to tell you this, God doesn't do things quickly, but he does them suddenly. Okay? Here's the end of this story, Acts 2-2. Suddenly, after all this time, a sound like a mighty, violent, rushing wind came from heaven, and the Holy Spirit filled the house where they were striving, staying. All they had to do was stay, and the Holy Spirit would come. And he didn't come quickly, but he came suddenly. You know what that means? It means when God's timing is perfect, everything changes. God don't have to come in and change things brick by brick. He comes in and renovates the whole house in one moment. Let me say it this way. That means for this week, you should live with an expectation. This might be the week your kids text you and say, I want to come to church with you next week. You should live as though this week, you, this is the week that, that your marriage, it's been in contention for months, but this is the week that God just blows and all of a sudden contention's gone and peace returns to your home. This could be the week that somebody, your, your supervisor texts you and says, we're getting ready to launch a new site and we want you to lead that expansion. It, it may not have been quick, you may have been waiting for a while, but God can do it all very quickly. And I just want to say, listen, it's always bad before God does something big. It always looks natural before he does the supernatural. But don't you think just because it's dark, he can't turn the lights on in a second in your situation? You know, I, I love the tension in that. Um, a friend of mine told me over a meal years ago about his great aunt. She, um, she had a son who was very young and had a seizure disorder. And this is many years ago, so they didn't have modern, you know, medicines to, to correct this. And honestly, doctors told her, there's nothing we can do, and this boy needs to live a very limited life. You need to protect him. Don't send him to school. He doesn't, can't play sports. He doesn't need to be with friends. You just keep him bundled up in your house. And this mom said, that's not what God created my son to do. So she decided she was going to fast and pray until this boy was healed. And what she decided to do, if you don't know what fasting is, it's where we give up the time we would normally put into eating, and instead we go and pray. It's a way of us sacrificing something we all love in order to show God we're serious about what we need. So she decided, I'm going to fast dinner until he's healed. And the first week, she missed seven dinners, but you know what? She's focused. This is her son. But then a week turned into a month, and a month turned into three months, and a, three months turned into a year, and one year turned into three years. For three straight years, every time it was dinner time and people gathered around the table, she went to her room and sought God for her son. Think about the Christmas dinners, Thanksgiving dinners, birthday dinners she missed. Must have felt like this is never going to happen. I'm in here missing some of the best parts of my life. But she stayed with it. One day she's in a service. And she's in worship, her son's beside her. And she said, I just sense the Holy Spirit say, today's the day. I want you to pray for your son. I'm going to heal him. She said she gathered a couple of people that are in a congregation around her. She said, come on, we're going to pray. 
she stretched her hands and she said, when I prayed for him, he just fell over like he had died. And she said, everybody around me thought, he, oh, he's having a seizure right now. She said, but a few seconds later, he sat up and his eyes were bright. He had a big smile across his face. And she said, baby, do you feel any different? He said, I feel brand new. She said, he did not have another seizure for the next 63 years of his life. Now, here's what I love about that story. Three years is a long time to miss dinner. But the promises of God are so fulfilling that once she received her suddenly, she never regretted those three years. Listen, I know it's been a while. I know it doesn't seem like it's going to change. I know things, it just seems like this, this whole thing is just futile. Listen to me. Waiting never seems worth it while you're waiting. But once you see what God does, once you see how fulfilling and satisfying what he's promised you is, you're not going to regret the waiting. And I know for many of you, it just feels like even recently in your mind, you've been ready to give up, throw away something, to exit a season, to, to just start over. And I just sensed by the Spirit of God this week as I was praying, him giving me many of your faces. And as I prayed, here's what I thought. There's more in them than they realize. Because they, with all they've been through and all they've faced, they wouldn't even still be showing up if the Holy Spirit wasn't at work in them. And here's what I know. If he's at work in you, that means he's going to work around you. He doesn't do part A without part B. Some of the greatest victories in your life are just simply going to be because you outlasted whatever you're facing. So here is the word of the Lord. Stay until you see it come to pass. I want you to stand to your feet, and I want to pray for you today. Here's what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for those who have come to the end of their own faith, they would discover what the Bible calls a gift of faith. Let, let, let me say it this way. The Scripture presents that we've all been given a measure of faith, but here, here's what, what it means. It means your faith has a measure, which means that it can run out. But when it runs out, then we tap into an auxiliary faith called the gift of faith. It's when we don't have any more faith, the Holy Spirit says, I'll give you some of mine, and his is endless. So some of you feel like you have no more faith. You're about to experience the gift of faith, where the Holy Spirit, it's like you tapped into a whole other source of staying power, straight from heaven, for whatever you're believing for. So I'm going to pray, and I, if you need that, I'm just going to ask, would you bow your heads and open your hands just in a receiving posture today? Heavenly Father, I pray a gift of faith. It's listed in Scripture. It's highlighted by Paul. And I ask for it to be deposited into every single heart. People who have come to the end of their faith for their marriage, their kids, their, their future, the business, their own, their own faith, even just that they could stay with this, an addiction. As they've come to the end of themselves, may they find the beginning of you in Jesus' name. May they find a gift of faith. And may it pick up their head May it brighten their eyes, and may they walk out, not of their own fortitude, but of the Spirit of God, alive in them, giving them the ability to believe, giving them the ability to stay, giving them the ability to stand. When all else we've done, Scripture says, stand and stand. And so, Lord, we stand because you're trustworthy. We stand because you're faithful. We stand because even when we can't see it, you're working. And we will see the goodness of God come to pass in our lives. We will see your promises because they are yes and they are amen. They are yes and they are amen. They are yes and they are amen. In Jesus' name, and everybody says amen, amen, and amen. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.